We asked a new keyboardist for Kansas, Tom Brislin, if it's still, in fact, Kansas. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Music. I changed my mind with bands as far as how many remaining members there are in the band. We just found out that without Frankie Benelli, the last original member of at least the heyday of Quiet Riot, Quiet Riot is going on without him. Some fans are too keen on that. And with Kansas only having two members from their heyday left in the band, you have to ask, is it still Kansas? Listening to the new album, however, it's an incredibly strong project, multi-layered in many ways, where you have to listen to it many times, just like maybe Left Overture or Point of No Return, the big ones. But it's a question I have to ask band members when Heyday members are running thin. So I asked Tom Brislin, is it still Kansas? Well, I would say have a listen to the whole thing and come to a show. Yeah. And, and, then, and then draw your own conclusions. Because, and I don't think it's necessarily up for debate either. It is Kansas. It is Kansas. I mean, Phil and Richard have kept the, the tradition going. Billy has been a band member for so many years. David Ragsdale has a big history with this group and it's got the it's got the blessing from Kerry Livgren. He he came and sat in with us when we played in Topeka and uh, we all eight of us on stage playing Dust in the Wind and we do a little rehearsal before the show in in one of the dressing rooms which is great. I love being able to just warm up and vibe with the guys. And Kerry was just standing there hovering over me playing and we're doing hopelessly human or closet chronicles these real epics and and here's the composer literally over my shoulder observing no pressure or anything but he you know and after we were done he, he just looked at me and said you played that part right it was like okay god thank you <laughs> you seem like the and, type of guy though yeah you seem like the type of guy let me interrupt you that and and um they can kind of put you in any situation. You don't come unprepared. You don't seem like the type of guy that would ever be in a room. And I always tell my son, if you get embarrassed a few times, probably the best thing that could happen to you as a musician, because you'll never let it happen again. But you do seem like that type of guy. You, you come in, you're locked and loaded. You have to be. And you show respect to the band yeah. and the people who are putting their seal of approval on me. And, and they're saying, you're the guy we believe in you. You want to prove them right. And I, I like geeking out too. I, I love digging into every nook and cranny of those Kansas songs. So it, it was fun and a little obsessive too. <laughs> so uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, but who wants to be, yeah, who wants to be that musician that shows up and is the one that's getting dragged along by the rest of the band? That's, that is no fun. When you joined the band, did they tell you we we're going to record some new stuff or did you know at that point? Well, I knew that they were recording new material because uh, we were label mates. I was with The Sea Within, which had just released our album in 2018 on Inside Out. And we played in Germany at Night of the Prague Festival and Thomas from Inside Out had seen that show and uh, I stuck in his mind, I guess. So when Kansas needed a keyboardist, he recommended me. And so when I got the call from Phil Ehart, we were talking about everything. And I made it a point to ask about being part of the fun for the new original music. Because I knew that Kansas was, like you said, not just a touring band anymore, but also recording artists. So when Phil said, we want you to be a member of this band, that's something that hasn't been said to me too much in all of my travels playing with all these different classic rock acts. And I enjoyed all those other experiences, but I've always also been a songwriter and, you know, just plugging along with my band spiraling for years. And then I started doing my solo work and here it was, Kansas was not only asking me to be a part of them as a touring unit, but to really be a part of the band. And I said, you know, I write and I'd love to be a part of that. And they said, show us what you got. And I, I got to work on two fronts, one learning the show <laughs> and, uh, that, and all that great point of no return music that we were doing. And at the same time, writing music, writing lyrics, making demos in, in all the spaces in between our concerts in 2019. 
you, you seem to have really, first of all, to fit in in any situation, you never know. It's chemistry, it's moods, it's what you're going through. It's oh, so many different variables, even to, to put an album together. As you know, there's so many pieces to it. But the fact that you were able to fit in that pocket so well and add to it, that's the thing. That's why fans are so excited. That's why it's number 10 on Billboard. I mean, the thing is, that speaks for itself. I mean, you must, that must be satisfying for you. Oh, certainly. I mean, the, the response has been overwhelming. And it's, it's funny because a, a band at this stage, there are certain expectations. And I think we're already subverting them by making new music in the first place. And then to have it perform so well so far is, is it's, it's really rewarding. But for me, it's not so much about the accolades as it is the fact that the music is reaching more and more people. And we have a really loyal core fan base that comes to the shows. I've become friends with a lot of them because I see them at all the shows. And they were so jazzed for the new music. And we see that it's, it's expanded even further into other territories. And so that, that's very exciting for me, too. Memories Down the Line is a very topical song for, for right now, I find. When did you write those lyrics? That was something I wrote in the first half of 2019. Uh, like everything else, really, because we started recording the album in earnest in the summer of 2019. But I, we had been making the demos up to that point. And I still think that before the, <laughs> you know, it's never over till it's over. So there was still times when I was sort of figuratively throwing things under the, the door after the office was closed kind of thing. Like, we're almost done. No, I want to change this one word or something like that. But Memories Down the Line, I wrote in, in the spring of last year. And I wanted to make something that would resonate with people who listen to this band. People who have been around and, and are thinking about what they leave for the next generation. And then I get into some esoteric ideas there too. So it was fun. When did you become good enough to know that you could do this? At what age? I think I knew I wanted to do this well before I was good enough. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, I guess so it, it was, it's, it's strange. And, and I promise you, this is the truth. But since the time I was, I don't know, five or seven years old, all, I just knew that I was, going to be in a band. I wanted to be in a band. As soon as I discovered the vinyl albums that my sisters had lying around and, and like what, what were they listening to? Oh, Foreigner. Yes. Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, all the seventies rock. And that was the first music that I remember listening to along with some AM radio gold, you know, that would, would play in the car, like songs like Baker street or music box dancer or something like you would hear on AM radio in the seventies. So that was my introduction to music. And I still remember flipping over the back of the foreigner debut album and seeing a lineup and just even just, the earliest times I'm learning how to read, you know, and seeing, oh, wait, this is like a team. Everybody's got their own jobs, like sort of a, a cross between sports and superheroes for me. And I, I was always banging on the piano anyway, and I loved the piano. Music was always playing, and I just gravitated towards it. And I'm, I got to say that from the time I was like 10, 12 years old, I have always been trying to form a band or joining a band. <laughs> See, that's interesting. I've got 13 years on you, but you were discovering the music at a younger age at the same time, it seems, that I was doing it because I was a bubblegum kid back then. I was listening to uh, like the Starland vocal band. I was listening to ABBA and, and I never got, you know, how your ears mature after a while. I never had an older sibling that listened to anything but the Osmonds, you know, no disrespect to them, but it, you're exposed to whatever you're exposed to, right? And you don't know what you don't know when you're beginning. So you go, this is it. I guess this is everything right here. But I'm not surprised you should say that because I thought to myself, I looked at your age and I went, oh, okay, he's a child of the 80s. But he's got such musical depth, which obviously you don't get into yes. You don't tour with yes unless you know what the freak you're doing, you know? And being a child of the 80s, that's when I discovered the FM radio dial. That's when I felt like I was discovering music on my own when I first heard Men at Work or Duran Duran or The Police or 80s Yes, for that matter. That confused me at the time. It's like, it wait, confused what? a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, so I, I was like, this is, wait, no, this, this is cool. So um, in a good way. 
But yeah, so that's why the, the, the synth pop and, and, and new wave and rock music and pop music from the early 80s is so big of an influence on me as well. And, and getting into keyboards, lo and behold, you start discovering synthesizers and all the sounds that they create and that you can do the things you can do with it. It, it was a match made in heaven for me. Did you have so, a DX7? I didn't. Oh, come on. I, my paper route wouldn't let me afford the DX7. <laughs> well, although my brother, like my brother everyone had one. <laughs> look, my older brother, Bill, he was playing in rock bands in the Jersey Shore in the 80s. And he was multi-instrumentalist. He sang, played some guitar, played some keys. And I still remember in the mid 80s, he brought over the Roland Jupiter 6 synth. And this was what this was his axe for for live gigging professional. That's what, you know, I was looking at. Oh, this is a professional instrument and i played it and it, the sound was glorious and i've been in love with synths ever since and i still I'm, I'm the keeper of that keyboard now and i endeavor to use it on almost any recording i do and it is on the absence of presence album we'll have more from tom brislin the guy i could talk to for hours what an interesting chap huh that guy is going to have a long career in rock and roll in prog He's coming up again next week. Make sure you comment on our video, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos. Buy a t-shirt, help support our channel. Links in the description of this video, and all links for Kansas and Tom Brislin in the description as well. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music. Take care of yourself. Mm -hmm.